Uh, also put money into um, into our uh, long-term uh, uh, unfunded liabilities. Uh, so we put extra money into the retirement systems. Uh, we also put money into our reserves uh, because you need to have a rainy day at home. You need to have a rainy day uh, with the state. So those things were very, very good. I think where we missed the, um, uh, the boat was in terms of some of the things that we could have done for, for individuals in terms of um, uh, uh, toxic waste, for instance, or, 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 or pollution and, and dealing with that. Well, the, so, so those yeah. are certain issues, okay, yeah. and we'll kind of mm -hmm. talk about those in a second. I really want to really get an overall analysis from you on the health of the state and its okay. fiscal health. Okay. And, and I really specifically want to pinpoint you on this. Bob Bancroft was mm -hmm. here uh, saying he's very concerned about the fiscal health of the state moving forward, about what's coming ahead of us. And I want your viewpoint okay. as the state right. treasurer to give us your viewpoint okay. about the health of the state okay. and what you see uh, coming ahead. Certainly. Of so in order to have fiscal health, you have to do a couple of things. Number one, you've got to reduce your, your reliance on, on the credit card, on debt. And so, again, I need to talk a little bit Please, about yeah. things we're mm -hmm. doing there. So over the last uh, four years, we reduced it 9%, and then I believe 8%, and this year we're recommending another two-year biennium where we reduce that by another 7%. So we're re re reducing our reliance on debt, and I think that's extraordinarily important. For me, a structurally balanced budget means that your, your recurring revenues uh, are sufficient to meet your, your recurring expenses and to pay down your long-term liabilities. So from my perspective, uh, we've had surpluses over the last several years. So from a fiscal health perspective, we're doing okay. okay. Uh, that bottom line is, is okay. We, we, we've put more money into uh, reducing those unfunded liabilities mm -hmm. and to lower our appetite for debt. Those are good things. Uh, where I think that we need to take the next step is how do we take that bottom line and translate that into what does it mean for citizens mm. and how do they share in that bottom line? So I'm going to get back yeah, to that because issue. Yeah, because in a sense it's a double question. It's like yeah. how is the state doing mm -hmm. and then how are, are the citizenry doing? Mm -hmm. It's sort of a double-edged question exactly. with those yeah. uh, parameters. Right. So. Now, again, re I, I'm all for reducing costs for the taxpayer, and I've got to be blunt about that. You need to find ways to do that. So one of the things that we've worked on is our pension programs. And over the, over the years, we've lowered the, the – we have a big unfunded liability, and that mm -hmm. was something because we weren't doing the right things in terms of the bottom line. Mm -hmm. From around 1990 to 2007, we weren't paying the, um, our, our – paying down our credit card, essentially. We weren't doing that. And now we're paying for those uh, for the sins of the past, to be very frank. Mm. And for me, we've done good things there. We're moving forward. Uh, we've looked at ways that we can make that more efficient. We've asked employees to, to assist. We've worked with the legislature. And all in, we're going to save the taxpayers from 2010 to 2038 $1.3 billion. Wow. That's um, and that's, that's exciting it to is. me. That's, that's part of our job as a fiduciary of taxpayer dollars. But at the same time, and this is the, 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 the um, the innovative things that you can do with smart finance. At the same time, we're able to maintain benefits for retirees, mm -hmm. make sure that people, when they get to an end of their career, they have adequate retirement. Because that gets back to your, your com comment about fiscal health and more economic health. Mm -hmm. When people have adequate income in retirement, uh, they buy goods and services. And that's part of the economic generator. So just cutting isn't the answer. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, just spending is also not the answer. It's a delicate balance mm -hmm. of looking at how do you get best value for the taxpayer and best value that is shared by all the taxpayers. So just a reminder, if you have a question for Beth about uh, state finances, uh, you can dial in directly and ask that question at 862-3966. Beth, we'll uh, continue on this uh, light here uh, a little bit. Um, what do you see then as the the near term and maybe even the long term challenges that the state is facing that you know you've alluded a little bit here but maybe you can be a little bit more in depth uh, that perhaps uh, some of the viewers out there aren't aware of okay. uh, that you're uh, taking a good look at right well, now. I think there are a couple of things you know one of the one of the things that we do when we're in election season, we talk about, you know, what's wrong all the time. Mm. And, we talk, and that almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, we can't afford these programs. Um, on the other side, um, you know, you can't, you have to invest in your assets. And I think our assets are our people. And our assets are our natural environment, our, mm. our lakes and rivers. So we need to invest in those assets. You know, put it in simple economics. If you're, if you're, if you're, um, 
if you're manufacturing something, we're going to use widgets. I never, actually, I've used the widget example several times. I don't know if the widget actually exists. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. But if you're making widgets and you've got a machine that makes widgets, you need that machine to be efficient and you need it to be, you need to invest in it every year to make sure that it continues to make widgets and it doesn't break down. And for me, we need to invest in, in the things that help grow the economy. And mm. one of them is our natural resources. Mm. Uh, right now, um, uh, according to studies that are a couple years old now, uh, $2.5 billion of, um, um, of uh, economic activity in tourism. If you, ha if you let your natural resources degrade, mm. that's not going to continue. Mm. So for me, um, investing in our natural resources, investing in our, nat in, in our lakes and our rivers makes sense from an economic side. Mm -hmm. It also makes sense from a health and safety side because about 42% of our drinking water is from surface water mm -hmm. across the state. So we need to take a look and recognize that you have to make proactive investments in our natural resources and in our people. Uh, if you want to grow the economy, I think that you need to be more positive about the assets that Vermont does have, our mm -hmm. quality of life, uh, the ability to, um, to, to find good, good jobs in this state. There are, they are there, and we have a more diverse economy than we did, let's say, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do have workforce stresses. Uh, we need to get the education system lined up so that it meets some of those workforce needs, and I think that we're making progress there. I think people are recognizing that. I hear a lot about our demographics and our aging demographics. Mm -hmm. Those, you know, we need to see those as challenges that we can address mm. and move forward. If you just look at them as problems and say we can't, we can't afford programs, then what you're doing is having a self-fulfilling prophecy and a downward spiral. So I, I want to kind of speak about some of the programs because you found some money for our lakes and streams, mm -hmm. and we'll get into that. But I just want to touch base on something here that you just raised here about programs and things like that. Do you think paying people to move to the state of Vermont is a good idea. Um, we see uh, from the economic development, Michael Sherling's team, uh, scenarios like this. And yeah. uh, I'm curious if you think that's a good idea. Okay. Well, I'm going to be blunt. I have not had the opportunity to look at the data. I have heard from them that they had a lot of economic, I mean, a lot of activity and a lot of interest in the state um, as a result of that. Um, uh, but I have not looked at the specifics of that, p that particular program. But to bring individuals to the state, we have to have a message that says we're a vibrant state. Mm -hmm. We're a state that's growing. We're a state that provides um, opportunities in terms of health care, opportunities in terms of uh, child care, mm -hmm. opportunities in terms of good wages. And to see that those are investments in our future and grow the economy that way. I think that if you're young and you want to come to Vermont, you want to hear about the attributes that it has that attracts you. And we need to also have an education system that prepares uh, students for the skills that they need in our new economy. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so uh, moving on, you have found some money uh, for our lakes and streams uh, and uh, increased water quality. It's sort of a two-pronged question in a sense. First of all, thank you for finding that money. And why was that money even there in the first place in a sense? I mean, I think um, Vermonters want to make sure that their government is operating as efficiently as possible and that this money wasn't just loosely floating around there. Well, just, we don't have you know, loosely floating money, I can so, assure you. We're in yes. pretty good shape at the treasurer's office, and we can account for uh, we can account for every penny. So we don't have any loose change under the uh, the cushions anyplace. Um, so but, this was by finding efficiencies. By and, finding efficiencies. So um, just to put the the, the the lake issue in per, in perspective, uh, and again, I should say lake rivers right. across the state, because 94 percent of the state, 94 percent of the state is under what's called a TMDL, which is a total maximum daily load, which is essentially a pollution budget. And the only part of the state that isn't under a TMDL, a pollution budget with the AP, EPA, is uh, the Bennington area and they have PFOA. So we've got the issues across the state that we're working on with that. And again, going back to the widget analogy, investing in your natural resources. Mm -hmm. We get fees, taxes. I think I heard a, a number someplace around $300 million um, in, in income to the state from that tourism business. Mm -hmm. So it's an important part of our economic uh, um, um, uh, structure and fabric and it also helps create jobs. So in looking at this, I saw it as an investment. 
Um, and we were able to, to take a look at our capital budget, our, our, our money that we, we have in our capital planning, and we saw where, for, for, for some, reason, some reasons that, um, that are one time, we were able to, to pull out some of the money that was going to go to other projects, reprioritize some of those projects, and find about uh, $50 million over, the, over a two-year period mm -hmm. so that we'd have $25 million per year that mm -hmm. could be used to assist us in, the, um, in, in creating a bridge to a long-term plan. Now, you have also uh, indicated that this is by no means anywhere near enough. Um, can you speak to about what you think it would actually take okay. uh, in terms of dollars and cents and a, a, a year commitment? How long Certainly. of a commitment? You so we, we did an analysis, and, and this is the great thing about Vermont, collaborative work. We had 23 stakeholder meetings with environmentalists, with farmers, with business people, uh, with local town officials, 23 meetings with about 1,000 people. Wow. And uh, so there was a pretty comprehensive study. We asked them, what are the different sources of ways to, to approach this? What revenue sources might be used? What financing ideas you have? What efficiencies you might identify? Um, and uh, boiled that down. And we also did some cost analysis, uh, uh, bringing all the different tech uh, groups together. We worked very closely with agriculture, natural resources, all states' transportation departments, and they were very helpful and very cooperative. The bottom line for us is that we saw that we needed to put in um, to meet. The, there was a there was a total amount, 2.3 billion. Wow. That, of, of, of needs over over a 20-year period. Now, some of that is already met through existing resources, so we we we, we counted for that, and there was about I think it's about 1.25 uh, uh, billion that was remaining. We looked at that over a 20-year period, and uh, we were, we were talking someplace in the area of 60-some um, odd million dollars a year. Some of that we called Tier One and Tier Two. Tier One are must-haves, mm. things that we need to do. Um, in tier two, were the things that are good to have bend the cost curve, but aren't necessarily essential at this m moment. Tier one came out to about $48.5 million per year. Now, mm. We also recognize that that's an all-in cost. That's not government cost. That's not just the state. That's local government, and that's also businesses. That's also farmers. That's also um, uh, people that, uh, 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 that that run your local retail businesses mm. and the like. So it's an all-in cost. Mm. And what we said is the state should be looking to assist with half of that. Mm. So we came up with about $25 million yeah. is our target and said that minimally we need to look for $25 million per year. Mm. Do you think we're going to find it? Well, we did for the first two years, right, yeah. and I think that that gave us time to come up with a plan. Okay. I'm optimistic that we can do that, okay. um, but I think it needs some work from the legislature. Frankly, I was a little disappointed last year with both the administration and, and to some extent the legislature, but all folks involved with this, that we didn't get this moving a little further. Uh, we've got two years of funding, um, but in order to stay on target, we need to come up with a solution and implement it in this coming year for fiscal year 20. Okay. And for me, uh, I'm optimistic that we can do it, but there are three decisions that have to be made. One is, how do you allocate that $25 mm -hmm. million? Who gets what piece of the pie? Right. Yeah. Uh, and that's a policy decision that the legislature needs to, to, to take a look at. Mm -hmm. We can help with that. We can help in terms of analysis of where you get better bang for your dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, that is a policy decision that the legislature and the governor and the administration are going to have to, to address. The second is, how do you deliver the services? Mm -hmm. How do you deliver those? And uh, there are different models. Uh, we did a 90-some-odd page report uh, with a lot of attachments after that as well. And in that report, we identified three or four different types of models, um, some type of utility model, mm -hmm. A uh, local planning model uh, uh, where you do block grants to municipalities and, and to regions. I'm a firm believer that we need to push this money down into the communities. Mm. We do not need to create more state bureaucracy. We need to get that money out to the communities. And s the third decision is what is the financing or funding source? And I'm okay with using existing resources. I'm, I'm, I'm prudent and thrifty with your tax dollars. Mm -hmm. um, but they have to be reliable. They have to be measurable, predictable, and not part of and built into the base budget. It can't be catch as catch can. It can't be this year we use this, next year we use this. We have to have a system where we're putting um, a firm plan in place for years. We've got years one and two covered. We need to cover three through 20. Right. And uh, for me, 
that's a big goal that I'm confident that the legislature, both the House and Senate, put a great deal of work into this last year. We need to finish it up. Okay. Beth, we're uh, just down to our last minute. Uh, thank you so much for your time here today. Why don't you just uh, give us a 30-second closing statement about your candidacy and what you hope to achieve for these next okay. two years? Well, you know, I've been treasurer since 2011. I love the job. It's the best job in the state. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just uh, something that I've been doing government finance for 42 years. Um, for me, there's some unfinished work that needs to be done. Retirement security for those 104,000 individuals that do not have that. We have a program called ABLE, Achieving a Better Life Experience, which is a program to help individuals with disabilities get to financial security. Financial literacy programs. We, we, we've done a great deal of work there. We need to do more. Uh, that's important to me. Bottom line is we've got work to do. I'm proud of the work we've done. I think we've been good with taxpayers. We've been good with our citizens in terms of looking at innovative, smart Smart financing, we need to do more. Very good. Beth Pierce, my thanks for uh, joining us here this evening on our uh, live candidate forum for the 2018 general election. A reminder, you can go to our website, ch17.tv, for a complete list of upcoming candidate forums. And don't forget that early voting has already begun here in the state of Vermont. You can register to vote and cast your ballot on the same day. And don't forget to join us here Tuesday, September, uh, rather Tuesday, November 6th at 7 p.m. for complete election results. For all of us at Town Meeting Television, Town Meeting Television, Channel 17. I'm Matt Kelly. Thanks for watching.